Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. For some analysis on the attacks in Brussels and the fight against terrorism, we are joined by CBS News security analyst and former number two at the CIA, Michael Morrell. Farah Pandith from the Council on Foreign Relations, who is the former special representative to Muslim communities at the State Department. And the Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg, who's written extensively on national security. Mike, let me start with you. Where are we right now after this attack? John, I think two broad points. One is we have an unprecedented terrorist network in Europe. Um, there's been 12 ISIS attacks in Europe the last two years. There's been half of those in the last six months. Um, very large problem. We have 2,000 foreign fighters coming back to Europe from Iraq and Syria. Um, we've got a very sophisticated capability of those guys because they got the training in Iraq and Syria. And we have real capacity and capability problems on the part of European services. Um, this is not only a problem for Europe, it is a clear and present danger for the U.S. homeland because of the ease of travel from Western Europe to the United States. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is Europe as a harbinger for what we might see in the rest of the world. ISIS is under pressure in Iraq and Syria. Um, the, the consequence of that, and that's important and that's necessary and we need to do more of that. The consequence of that of those is some of those 40,000 people who went there to fight are going to start going home. So it gives ISIS the opportunity to create Europe-style networks in the rest of the world. So it's going to get worse before it's going to get better if, I mean, Secretary Kerry says real progress is being made, mm -hmm. but Mike Morrell did just well, suggested well, the, clear and present danger and unprecedented. Those are not words suggesting progress. Unfortunately, the real progress in one place leads to real danger in others. The more pressure you put on ISIS in its territory, uh, the more it feels a need. First of all, the people will be leaving. Uh, will be spreading out, we'll smash them one place that spreads. Uh, and the second problem is they need to prove their viability to their to their audience. They need to prove that they're still a capable organization, and that's why the, the, the tempo of these attacks could, could increase. Far, let me ask you about that. Secretary Kerry mentioned this, yeah. that this is a part of a pitch, that this is important for the public relations aspect of it. What's your take on that? So first of all, I mean, the the complexity of what's happening with ISIS in Syria and Iraq um, does have a reflection in Europe, but we have to understand that European Muslims have always mattered and they continue to matter. And it's been an important thing for us since actually the Danish cartoon crisis. And if you look back at what you're seeing with 44 million Muslims in Western Europe, and you're thinking about the issues that are layered upon each other about an us and them narrative that they feel, right. and the identity crisis that they feel, ISIS is just accelerating something that has already existed. So for the last 15 years, we're now just looking at this in terms of Charlie Hebdo, as serious as that was, in terms of Brussels and what might come afterwards. But we need to look back to where we came from, understand what's happening to the generation that's grown up, and to understand very importantly that the things that are happening across Western Europe are going to matter, as Mike said, to our bottom line, because the ideas and the feelings of the identity crisis that they're ha having ricochet in our country country as well. Uh, just one, one quick point on that. Uh, I mean, something that we have to uh, consider is that, is that ISIS's goal is to convince Muslims in the West that there is no space for them right. in the West. Uh, and so it's not, it, so what they're trying to do is create a, a situation in which Muslims are forced to choose between Western assimilation and, and, and aligning with, with radicalism. And that's why the politics, not only in Europe, but here, matter so much. I mean, I was going to say, the question is practically what can we do about this problem, right? Um, and it's one thing, right, to be hopeful that the Europeans can get their act together. Um, and it's quite another thing to lead them into the right place. So I think we need some sort of U.S. joint, U.S.-EU joint CT effort. Think about U.S.-Pakistan after 9-11, where we sat down and worked with them, where we put our information on the table, they put their information on the table, we, we fused that in a way that allowed us to go on the offense against the terrorists and allowed us to be on the defense here at home because we had the, the right information. I want to get back to this point about the neighborhoods. Do you want to add in? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the kind of coalition that we're talking about is one is an intel coalition, but there's, yeah. no, there's no coalition for soft power. We have not joined forces Explain in that. Explain to people what soft power means. So on the ideological component, I was in Brussels two days before the attack. And a very senior official in the Belgian government talked about the fact that their cities are dealing with something um, that, that is the most serious since World War II. 
And what, they, what this gentleman meant by that was that this, this idea that the ideology uh, is, has spread, this, this narrative of the uh, identity crisis, of an us and a them, is turbocharged by everything that's happening, whether it's the minarets, the no minaret ban, whether it was Geert Wilder's burning of the Quran, whether it is the current climate of, of conversation here in the United States. All of these things build on each other. So what I mean by a soft power coalition is uh, c governments across the world and in Europe specifically, alongside with civil society, turbocharging and scaling up all of the kind of pushback that we need to see that, that pushes against this us and them narrative. But and we haven't seen that kind of thing. The, the, the problem, I mean, excellent points, but the problem is we are not going to get the French to change their culture. Uh, and it's, we're not going to get the Belgians to integrate Muslims. What we can do is convince the Belgians to accept U.S. counterterrorism help. I mean, these are great points, but we're not going to reshape so European society. I don't, I don't think we can, and nor should we, but I think that there is a way in which we talk about things. Everything that we have talked about is an us and them paradigm, no matter where we are. Do you include that with American politicians who talk about surveillance in neighborhoods? Is that the kind of thing that... So I'm not quite sure what that means in terms of a, a surveillance of neighborhoods yeah. that are yeah, Muslim in America, police, yeah. because Islam has been in this country since the very beginning right. of our nation. So, it, but, but to your larger point, what happens in our country, the conversations that happen, absolutely reflect on, on what the general climate is. Our first line of defense is Muslims themselves. They are the ones that actually see things for the first time and the ones that can push back against foreign ideologies that come in. We cannot isolate them. Well, I, so we've got the cultural clash in European cities. And Mike, I want to go back to you on the tactical question. You've got 28 different countries. You talk about us, the U.S. helping with counterterrorism. But one of the things I hear is that just getting the countries to share is just, a, it well, seems like a mess. John, that's why we have to lead, right? That's why we have to go in there and say, this is how you get this done. And it's not, only, it's not only the heads of our intelligence community that need to do that, it's the President of the United States, it's the Secretary of State, it's the Secretary of Defense who need to make the case that this has to happen, right? Because, because not only are you at danger, but we are at danger as well. It is not entirely clear to me that President Obama would uh, be the sort of president who says, we are going to lead the European anti-terror charge. I mean, there's a, there's a through line in his policies that says that other countries also need to lead, uh, especially on questions that directly have, have bearing on, on their security. But, but it might come to the point where he realizes that the Europeans are so debilitated in what they can do that, that there's no choice. But the Americans did lead on engagement with Muslims in the Bush administration. We were listening on the ground across Western Europe. That's the first uh, effort that we actually pushed forward and began to listen to what's happening in places that nobody in Europe was, was going to. We heard what the Muslims themselves were saying, and we need to do more of that. That's what has been missing for the last 15 years. Do more of that in Europe. No. We need to do that more in Europe because it, it, when you're talking about American lead, uh, Amer the American lead here, America was the one that put... put uh, our efforts on the ground to actually listen to what kinds of things were happening organically. It wasn't European governments that was doing that. It was the American government that was doing it. So we have demonstrated both in the hard power side and in the soft power side that we can, in fact, lead. And I think that this idea of a coalition, an integrated coalition of both hard and soft power, will make the difference to the threat we're facing right now. Finally, Jeffrey, on your, uh, the, your point on President Obama, his reaction this week to this, you've just spent a lot of time thinking about his foreign policy. What did you see in his reaction to this terrorism that either was in keeping with his worldview or was different from? His reaction kept very much uh, with his worldview, which is that I am not, I, the President of the United States, I'm not going to be dictated to by terrorism. I'm going to keep to my schedule. I am not going to sit around the White House waiting for another bad thing to happen. I'm going to go about doing the business of the United States. The problem comes in, in the criticism uh, that he spent 41 seconds in Cuba talking about uh, Belgium. And so, so he has not yet found, I, I think, sort of the right middle path. Uh, talking about it, uh, talking about it in a way that comforts Americans without playing to fear mongers, but, but also not being captured by this one problem. All right. Okay. Thanks, all of you. Thank we'll you. be right back.